There is no testimony without a test, and there is no message without a mess. Well, Jonah, in this passage, we're going to consider today, does exemplify that statement. Just like there's no victory without a fight, and there's no crown without a cross, there is definitely a mess before Jonah's message, and there is definitely a test before his testimony is clear. Jonah is a prodigal prophet. He's a runaway. We've already seen God call him to go 550 miles east to Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, and instead he tries to run 2,500 miles in the opposite direction to Tarshish. Now, in the Jonah story, we often focus on the fish, we focus on the city of Nineveh, rightly so. But we often forget the Ninevites are not the first ones saved in the book. Jonah has a testimony. It is antithetical. It is the very opposite of everything a testimony should be. Jesus says in Matthew 5 that we are to let our light shine before men, that they would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Jonah does the very opposite. Rather than letting his light shine, his testimony is one of basking in the darkness. Yet what we are going to see today is God's powerful gospel is greater than the messed up testimony of a prodigal prophet. That God's powerful gospel is greater than Jonah's mess and failure of the test. So look with me at Jonah 1, beginning at verse 11. We will pick up right where we left off last week. So they, the sailors, said to Jonah, What should we do to you that the sea may become quiet for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. It was becoming rougher, worse and worse. So Jonah said to them, lift me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm, will become quiet for you. For I know that on account of me, it is my fault this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to dry land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming increasingly stormy against them. It was becoming even wilder. Then they called on Yahweh and said, Ah, O Yahweh, we earnestly pray, do not let us perish on the count of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Yahweh, as you have pleased, you have done." So they lifted Jonah up, and they hurled him into the sea, and the sea stood still from its raging. Then the men greatly feared Yahweh, and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. And Yahweh appointed a great, a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish, the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is the word of the Lord. The sailors realize that Jonah is the cause of the storm, and they realize now that he is also the key to quieting the storm on the sea. It seems they come to Jonah in this next section of this first chapter looking for some chord of theological guidance. Jonah, what do we do? You're a prophet of the one true God. We've already tried this our way. We got rid of our cargo. We threw it into the sea trying to keep the ship safe. It didn't keep the ship safe. We called on our gods. Our gods did not answer. And so they come to Jonah and they're seeking. This is Jonah's opportunity. This is a a non-Christian comes to you and says, what must I do to be saved? And what does Jonah say? He doesn't say, repent and believe the gospel. He doesn't say, God loves you. God died on the cross for you. He doesn't say, repent. In fact, he is the most worthless preacher possibly in recorded history right here in this passage. He doesn't lead the way with confessing his sins. He doesn't give them any guidance. We're told in verse 11 that the situation is getting serious. 
The storm is increasing. It's becoming more tempestuous. It's, it's walking and storming in the Hebrew, literally is what it says here. Now, we often think of the fact that Jesus was able to calm a storm in a second with just one word. But we often forget that Jesus is capable of brewing up a massive storm in the blink of an eye. Remember in chapter 1, verse 4, when Jonah was running away on the ship, it says that God hurled the storm onto the sea. Now, it's like the pitch that was thrown is getting faster as the storm is churning, and they are on the brink of losing their very lives. The word hurled here means that this is no ordinary storm. It's like the heat in the oven just got turned up a whole bunch more. And God is sovereignly in control at this moment. I love how the writer of Proverbs talks about this. In Proverbs 30 verse 4, it says, Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped the waters in his garments? Who has established all the ends of the earth? And what is his name? And what is his son's name? The wisdom writer says, surely you know. In other words, it is God who holds the wind and squeezes them when he pleases. And here, I think we are told this because God is coming after this worthless preacher, this horrible witness. I want to say to you today, if you are God's child, and you are going in the opposite direction God wants for you, God is also turning the heat up on you. God is coming after you. God can overtake the swiftest man. God can baffle the most intelligent soul. God can overthrow the strongest warrior. God can bow down the most prideful man and tame the most impulsive attitude and subdue the mighty. Another way to think of this is if you think you are God's child and you don't ever have any storms and you don't feel like God's ever coming after you, it may be that you have your family mixed up. Maybe you're not in the family you think you are. For the writer of Hebrews says, quoting Proverbs 3, those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he flogs, he corrects every son whom he receives. If you don't ever have discipline in your life, it may be that you're somebody else's kid. When you read a text like this, and someone goes, you know, I've been saved 20 years and the Lord never bothered me. The problem is probably you're someone else's child. Maybe you're not a backslidden Christian. Maybe you never front slid in the first place, I would propose to you. You see, Jonah is about a believer who is desperately in need of the gospel, who is running from God, has ignored and despised the commandments of God, and God is going to rescue him, and God is using a literal storm to get his attention, to get this disobedient child to return to him. So if you are shirking your responsibilities, and if you are trying to hide out from God, please hear these words. There is a storm sure to break where you're hiding. And that's exactly what's happening here. Now in verse 12, Jonah says, lift me up. This very well may be sacrificial language. Lift me up and hurl me like God hurled the storm, hurl me into the depths of the sea. How many of you had a little brother or sister or a friend, right, at the pool? One, two, you know the story, right? You've done that before. It's kind of what you feel in Jonah's words here. But the question is, is this heroic, sacrificial love, or is this rebellion? Is this repentance from Jonah or more rebellion against God? I don't think Jonah is repenting here. I don't think he is saying, I deserve death for my sins. Just go ahead and kill me so you live. I think just like Nero fiddled when Rome was burning, Jonah was sleeping in the ship when it was sinking, and here he's trying again to take the easy way out without any care 
for these before him. He could have gotten on his knees and prayed. He could have said, listen, all you got to do is turn the ship around. I need to go to Nineveh. Instead, he takes the easy way out and he says, just kill me. Throw me into the sea. I would rather die than do God's will. I would rather uh, die than go to Nineveh around those people. I think the point here is you keep running to Tarshish away from God long enough and your life will become worthless and meaningless to you. The longer you run from God, the less you value your life. The more in despair you'll be, the more dark the thoughts will be, the more obtrusive they will be. Sooner or later, you're not going to even value your very existence anymore. Life won't be a gift. The sun won't be beautiful. The trees won't sway in the breeze anymore. You won't remember the love of God at the cross. Your life is going to get so narrow, so dark, so dim, your testimony so terrible that you won't even value your life. Hurl me, throw me. Four times. Verse 4, God hurled the wind. Verse 5, the sailors hurled the cargo. Here, Jonah says, hurl me into the sea later. One, two, three, go. Many of us would have said in response to Jonah, if we were in these sailors' shoes, bon voyage. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Or, for some of the rest of you, walk the plank, sir. It's all yours. We would have been glad to see him go. But notice what these pagan sailors do. Verse 13. However, this is a shock, the men rowed desperately to return to dry land. But they could not, for the sea was becoming increasingly stormy against them. It would have been natural for them to toss Jonah into the sea, but they were afraid Jonah's God might punish them for killing him. So they do everything in their power to try to save this man. In other words, I think this is recorded in the Bible to show us a stark contrast between Jonah's attitude, who is supposed to be this Jewish prophet, and the attitude of pagans in the 8th century. Notice how contrasted this is. Isn't it ironic that the so-called pagans are doing everything in their power to save Jonah's life, and he is doing everything in his power to leave Nineveh on a pathway to hell? They care about Jonah's soul and their skin. Jonah doesn't care about his skin, his soul, or the Ninevite's soul. Now, the sailors still don't get it yet. They don't got the gospel yet. They're about to. So in one last stitch effort, because they have love for their fellow men, they are not willing to treat his life so lightly. They go to the oars and they start rowing as dying men, trying to one last attempt to gain safety. This is like working to earn your salvation. If God sends the storm, I don't care how strong you are or how hard you row, you're not getting out of it unless God ends the storm. But they're trying everything in their power to save themselves. And I want you to notice no one will ever save themselves by being good or good works because you'll never be good enough. The great preacher George Whitfield said, get to heaven on your own strength? What? You might as well try to climb to the moon on a rope of sand as to get to heaven on your own strength. So many people are trying to be good enough, to earn God's favor, to please God, to save their own soul, to rescue their own life valiantly. These men are not uh, looked on here as being uh, lesser men or anything like that at all. It's a very noble attempt, but nobility doesn't get you into heaven. It's a very sincere attempt, but you can be sincerely wrong. You see that? They could not. Look at that in verse 13. But they could not. These four words are the turning point in the story. You can't beat the storm. You can't save yourself. You can't save Jonah. The storm of God's judgment is stronger than we are. We can't escape the storm no matter how hard 
we try. And then look what it says again. The sea was becoming increasingly stormy against them. This is being repeated over and over for a reason. The oven gets turned up a little hotter. You see that? It's back in verse 11, the same thing. God was not yet ready to have Jonah delivered to dry land. He had more to teach Jonah. When I read a text like this, I realize that my life and your life is going to have crises that you cannot control. It will be outside of your ability to handle. A storm will come. Listen, to these sailors, the sea was a place of lawlessness, which their gods had not tamed and they had no control over. In Greek mythology, Poseidon, Neptune, was the god of the sea. And they feel totally helpless and their gods totally impotent at this moment. It's going to happen to you too. You're going to get sick and you can't turn the tide. You are going to have marital troubles. And hear this, there's two people in every marriage and you are totally void of strength to change the other person you're married to. Impossible for you to do it. It could be a test that reveals you have cancer or a betrayal of a friend or a loved one or you could have a really terrible government that raises your taxes, gives all the money away to everyone else other than its own citizens and wrecks your economy so you can't pay your bills. I don't know what country that would be. It could be that your children walk away from the Lord. And you will be in a storm. And if we discover in this moment sin is the cause of our troubles, and we don't forsake our sin, and we don't respond rightly, guess what? It will become increasingly stormy against you. That's what the text says. And you can row as hard as you want. You'll never change your spouse's heart. You'll never defeat cancer. You'll never fix the government. There's certain things you are not sovereign over and you can't do. And you're going to feel weak, wounded, defenseless, and helpless. And by the way, that's exactly what you want to feel. Because... God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Listen, you read this storm here, and we are reminded, kids, you need to hear this. God is in control of nature. R.C. Sproul said there is not one rebel molecule in the universe. Today, our Baal, our Poseidon, our Neptune is the so-called mother nature our world worships. I want to say to you today, children and students, you better be far more worried about Father God than Mother Nature because she don't exist. When we hear a storm outside, we should remember God is sovereign. When you hear a bolt of lightning, you see the lightning and you hear the thunder crash, you should feel small. Remember, God is big and all-powerful. In verse 14, it says, Then they called on Yahweh. Before they were crying out to their gods, Allah, Mother Earth. Some of you, your gods you call on immediately are the gods of Facebook. You don't pray when you're in a crisis. You get on there to get everyone else's ridiculous approval. Someone, we always call on to bail us out. Some of you, it's the government. You're going to give the next two years of your life, you're going to waste it hoping a corrupt politician is going to fix this country. It's all you're going to talk about. It's all you're going to listen to. It's all you're going to watch. You are going to be consumed by politics. Many blood-sucking men and women. You're going to be consumed by them. Understand that's what's going to happen. I'm prophesying it, and I'm not a prophet. They will not fix your life, and they can't stop any storm on any sea that you're experiencing. I'm not saying Christians shouldn't be involved in government. 
I'm not saying Christians shouldn't care about politics. I'm not saying you shouldn't be very well read. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying they can't stop the storm. They'll probably make it worse. You don't believe me? Just look at the last 20 years. But they call on Yahweh. When a crisis comes, people get spiritual. Sometimes it's like this. God, if you deliver me, I'll get baptized twice. God, whatever it takes, I'll never miss church again. And it's always amazing. Like three weeks later, I can't find them. God, I'll be a pastor. I'll be a missionary. Okay, that's good. How about you start where you live? We start bargaining. Remember who these sailors are, by the way, just like you should remember who you are. These are men probably from the cities of Phoenicia. That was the major seafaring power of the 9th and 8th centuries. Tarshish was a Phoenician colony. This is remnants of the old Canaanite culture, widespread over Palestine before the time of Joshua. These men are not landlubbers. These are hardened, seasoned, professional sailors, mariners. And think about this. They are afraid of this storm. Phoenicians are known for their seagoing vessels. They are known for their skills on the seas. They realize this is not normal. This is supernatural. How do they make their living with their cargo? When they threw their cargo in the sea last week, they literally emptied their bank account. But they didn't just empty it. They went in the deficit because now they got to pay back everything they just threw away. They knew this was supernatural. And there was no probability of being saved. This shows the inadequacy of false gods. This shows there are no atheists in foxholes and there are none in violent storms on the sea as well. All of a sudden, they cry out, not to just some generic God. They don't just pick a God of their own imagination, the AA way. Notice what it says three times. They cried out to the Lord, the God of heaven and earth. Oh, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. There is no confusion. This is not a generic God. This is not a, a local idol or deity. They are praying for Jonah to Jonah's God when Jonah should have been praying for them. The character of so-called godless men can sometimes shame so-called followers of Jesus. Listen, what you're supposed to see here is Jonah, who is supposed to be a prophet of God, needed God's grace just as much, if not more, than these men needed it at this moment. That's what you should read. Lord Yahweh, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not put innocent blood on us. Their desire to rescue Jonah from divine punishment contrasts with Jonah's lack of compassion for the people of Nineveh. This shows us we should care. Hear this. Children, you need to hear this. Students, you need to hear this. You have a God-given responsibility to care about other souls. And your actions will have an effect on those around you. You are not a lone ranger. You can try to be one. You're not. You're not an isolationist. You can pretend to be one. Impossible. People say, yeah, I'm sinning. That's my own business. Impossible. Children hurt their parents when they don't obey the Lord. And parents who say, do as I say, not as I do, hurt their children when they don't obey the Lord. Husbands hurt their wives when they don't love them as Christ loved the church. And wives hurt their husbands when they don't respect them as the scriptures say. When they're not walking with the Lord. It is not just your business. There's no such thing as private sin. Listen, that's why we as Christians should be 100% public, bold, clear that we stand against society's sin. 
And we should not look, dress, act, think, behave like the world. It's called holiness, right? They shouldn't wonder. Listen, no Christian needs he, him in their pronouns. Why? Because you should look and act like a man. There should be no confusion. No Christian needs she, her. Why? You should look and act like a woman. We should be abundantly clear. God made men and women. Christians are people of truth. You don't need a Jesus fish on your business card. You need to act like Jesus. We don't need to wonder if we are a people for life. Like, I feel like we talk about this all the time. And then I see uh, recently a so-called survey of Christian denominations where like 54% of people in church don't think abortion is wrong. What in the world are churches teaching and preaching? Sin, public, affects public. Sin private affects public. You don't believe me? Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. God couldn't find ten righteous men to save that city. It is not just your business. When we have a country that literally is so confused, they've corrupted God's rainbow, the sign of God's covenant and mercy... We have a country that literally is having conversations about drag queen story hour. We have lost our minds. We are in direct rebellion against the Lord God Almighty. There should be no question that sin affects others. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Sin is serious and it spreads. When I said men should look like men and women should look like women, that includes modesty, by the way. I'm just going to meddle a little more. There's a crisis of this. Immodesty leads to more sin, by the way. And that's not just for ladies, gentlemen. Like, we as a people should look, think, act, and most importantly of all, love differently than the world. Jonah has no compassion at all. And it is affecting the very souls of these sailors, and it almost cost them their life in their eternity. I want you to note that. What did the sailors say? Oh, Lord God, you have done as it pleased you. They are saying God is sovereign. God does as he pleases and wishes. I am so tired of people saying God doesn't violate. God can't do. God isn't able. God won't. What world and what Bible do you live in? Your God is far too human if you think our God is limited in any way, any shape, or any form. These guys have better theology than probably the majority of Christians on Sunday morning in churches in America. Oh Lord, you have done as it pleased you. They're not saying this with a Rolls Royce and a full bank account and everything wonderful in their life. They are saying this with a ship about to sink, powerless to save themselves. Do you see that? Paul didn't say, rejoice in the Lord always, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, when he was on the top of his basketball career, and he was playing in the world championships. He said it when he was in a prison about to possibly suffer death for the name of Jesus. You can also 
do all things through a verse taken out of context. Don't forget that. And that's what a lot of you do all the time. Read this here. O Lord, you have done as it pleased you. Psalm 115, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Psalm 135, whatever Yahweh pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. The irony here is earlier in our text last week, Jonah said, I fear the Lord. He didn't act like it. These men are acting like they fear the Lord. And we're going to see how important that is in a minute. Look at verses 15 and 16. So they lifted Jonah up and they hurled him into the sea. And the sea stood still from its raging. Then the men feared, greatly feared Yahweh. And they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and they made vows. God hurled the wind. They submit to God. Now they hurl Jonah. How sad is it? They had to get rid of a follower of the Lord to have peace in their lives. How messed up is that? Some of our marriages were like, you literally believe, if I could just get rid of them, I'll be happier with me, my life. Shouldn't be that way. Some of your jobs, your, your fellow employees, instead of saying, I thank God, we've got a Christian working here who keeps their word, loves well, does things with excellence in all things to the glory of God. They say, I wish this creep would get lost. I wish they would be fired. Now, if they want to fire you because you love like Christ, amen. But if they want to fire you because you're a worthless employee, something has went wrong. Christians are not to be a hindrance. They are to be a help. And sadly, they submit to God. God answers their prayer. Jonah was a hindrance. His testimony was terrible. But notice, it's like, it's like going into a room and you flick the switch and the light turns off. At the moment Jonah hits the water, the storm stops. Exactly like when Jesus' disciples were in a boat and he was sleeping and they woke him up and they said, we are perishing, master. And he rebuked the wind and immediately it became calm. And then they worshiped him and they said, truly, you are God's son. So notice what happens here. First, they fear the storm. Then they're afraid when they find out that Jonah is running from God, verse 10. And now it turns into true fear, the fear of the Lord. What I'm saying is God often uses storms and pain and suffering as a microphone, as a megaphone, as a preacher's trumpet to get our attention as a wake-up call to turn to him. What this means is God did not create a universe where there is meaningless, random evil and pain. Let me just say that again. God did not create a universe where there is meaningless, random evil and pain. What this means is God has sovereignly ordained. He has a plan. He will be glorified. He has our good even in bad things that happen in the world. Because we believe all things work together for good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. Thomas Watson said, tomorrow may be our dying day. Let this day be our repenting day. The sailors use the covenant name of God. They fear Yahweh. It's the fear of Yahweh that's the beginning of wisdom. It is the name of Yahweh that is a strong tower that the righteous run into and are safe. If we turn from our sins, he will soon turn from his anger. That's what we see here. It's that simple. And it's that beautiful. And immediately there are works that follow their faith immediately they offer a sacrifice, immediately they take vows, immediately they will follow Jesus from this day forward. 
To you they cried, and you granted escape. And you they trusted, and they were not disappointed. You, God, have heard my vows. You have given me the inheritance of those who fear your name. Think about this. The prophet who is sent to rebuke the greatest king in the world, the king of Assyria, is rebuked by pagan sailors who first say, Jonah, would you please start praying and calling on your God? Just like God reproved the scribes and Pharisees by the mouth of children who called out Hosanna. Just like David was rebuked by Abigail. Just like Naaman was rebuked by his servants. God is humbling Jonah. And we see here in a most beautiful way, these men are very happy to lose all their cargo when eternity is in the balance, when they are on their deathbed, when they are one inch between heaven or hell, they are happy to lose everything because at that moment they found something, let me say it again, they found someone infinitely better, a treasure greater than anything this world offers. They found a savior in the Lord. Luther said, I would not give one moment of heaven for all the joys and riches of this world, even if they lasted for thousands and thousands of years. God was running to Jonah. God was running to pagan sailors. You can run from God. You can't hide from God. Jonah is drowning, and they are worshiping God. And think about this. Jonah dies one day. He's in heaven, and there's a reunion there. And Jonah sees these men in heaven, and he says, what are you pagan Phoenicians doing here? And they say, Jonah, you led us to the Lord by your disobedience. (laughs) Jonah's anti-missionary activity, his terrible testimony reminds us no matter how bad we botch it, God is sovereign. And God, with men it's impossible, with God all things are possible. You can run, but you can't hide. We end, just a moment left, verse 17. While the sailors are worshiping, Yahweh is working. It looks like Jonah is dying, but really there's more to the story. Jonah thinks he's done, but God hasn't quit on him. Yahweh appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. The power of God is seen in the winds, the storms, the sea. Later in chapter 4, it's going to be in a plant. Here, the power of God is in a fish. The winds, the seas, the fish all obey God better than Jonah. Do animals obey God better than you? The great fish is in exactly the right place at the right time. I mean, how much time did ha- happen here, right? We're talking, you drown pretty quick. The right place, the right time. Why? Because the right God. And so, this great fish is here. Now, what is this fish? We'll talk more about that later. Can't be identified with certainty. Some have said a large shark. I think that's very probable. Some have suggested a sperm whale. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 12, and he uses a Greek word that could mean a sea monster or a great fish. We know sperm whales have swallowed unusually large objects, including another 15-foot shark. Whale sharks have swallowed men who were later found alive in the shark's stomachs. It's true. The miracle was not that a great fish swallowed Jonah. We've got to get that. The miracle is that Jonah was not digested. That's the miracle. The miracle is that Jonah was swallowed for protection not to devour him. So, this seems totally impossible. And you have to ask, why does God choose this means? The ship could have turned around and went back to shore. 
Jonah could have hung onto a piece of floating wreckage and washed up on the beach half drowned. God could have raised someone up to take Jonah's place. But no, no, no. This is an intervention. God is going to save Jonah and use Jonah. And sometimes it takes a storm and a great fish to do it. Now, I know what you're thinking. In fact, I've read a lot of commentaries on Jonah, some that are from Christians, some that are not. And what I found is that this is the turning point right here. Everyone likes the book of Jonah until you get to this verse. And then the controversy begins. There was a well-known pastor here in Pensacola, Southern Baptist Church, who said from the pulpit, this is just an allegory. This didn't really happen. It's not history. I mean, literally in the last few years that happened. One of our biggest SBC churches. It's not there anymore. I'm glad. You get to this point, and you have to ask, could this have happened, and should we believe it? Well, I would suggest to you, the answer is found in the man who is the center of human history, the man on whom all history depends, the one who is God in the flesh. He's the one that will determine for us whether we should read this like an allegory or like a true story. So as we close, let's hear Matthew chapter 12. Some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered and said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, and no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Yes, this is a miracle. If you can believe that God created the universe out of nothing, why can't you believe this? If you can believe God parted the waters of the Red Sea, why can't you believe this? If you can believe that God fed the 5,000 with loaves and fishes, can you believe this? If you believe that God is so sovereign and so in control that you can't stop your own hiccups, you can't hold your breath indefinitely, and you can't stop a toothache because you're so weak from hurting. Why in the world? You can't stop your heart from beating. Why in the world can't you believe that God can do as he pleases? He's sovereign. Jesus likens his own death and resurrection to Jonah's time in this great fish. So as we close, a few points. Number one, a word from God came from Jonah. But Jesus came as the word of God. Jesus is better than Jonah. Jonah ran from the Lord's presence. Jesus came to this earth to reveal the Lord's presence. Jesus is better than Jonah. Jonah ran from God and from sinners. Jesus ran to sinners on behalf of God as God. Jesus is better than Jonah. The storm Jonah gave himself up to when he said, hurl me, was of his own fault and of his own raising. But the storm that Jesus endured was of our raising and sin. Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jonah slept in a stormy boat, and he was overwhelmed. Jesus slept in a boat in a storm and was at peace. Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jonah was willing to be thrown into the sea simply to die. Jesus was willing to be thrown in the sea of human affliction so we would live. Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jonah was not innocent, and yet the sailors worried about punishing him. Pontius Pilate, Judas Iscariot, said over and over, this is an innocent man. The thief said, this man has done nothing wrong. Jonah was guilty and not a victim. Jesus was innocent and took our guilt. Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jonah was thrown into the sea to save sinners on the boat of the wrath of the storm of God. Jesus went to the cross to save sinners from the wrath of God. Jesus was thrown into the storm of God's judgment, so through faith in his name, we would be saved. Jesus is greater than Jonah. 
Because of Jonah, some were saved from one nation and one boat. Because of Jesus, multitudes will be saved from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jesus was in the grave three days and three nights. Jesus is greater than Jonah. And lastly, Jonah needed a Savior or he would have been dead. Jesus is Jonah's Savior. Jesus is greater than Jonah. And if you are in the storm today and you look to Jesus Christ, who is greater than Jonah, he will run to you, he will rescue you, he will save you, he will change you. And what you need to do today is throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and follow him. Some of you have trusted in Jesus and you need to throw yourself into the waters of baptism. Die to self and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. His going down into the water signifies our death with Jesus, death to sin, burial, resurrection from the grave. It shows our baptism and we'll see next week the new life that comes from following Jesus. These were Jonah's first converts because... Jesus is greater than Jonah. Let's pray.